Thank you very much for the opportunity to be in Switzerland again after 45 years. Um, and to uh, engage with colleagues and peers in a discussion uh, that's unlike any other that I've had, uh, I think, since we started the Center for Art and Environment at the, universe, at the uh, museum. Um, Benoit came to us as a visiting scholar. Uh, and uh, I, how many months ago? A year ago? Less than a year ago. last uh, winter. Last winter, in yeah. December, and he, he wanted to uh, look at some of the things we have in the archives. Uh, at the museum, the archives are only about five years old. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But they have unique materials from Michael Heiser and Walter Di Maria. We have the first sketch of the lightning field done on a cocktail napkin in Las Vegas in 1971 that he did for his pilot, so the pilot could figure out where to look for land uh, to possibly situate the, the, the work. So um, it's a unique archive. Benoit came to study that, and we realized that there was an opportunity for unique collaboration. Uh, and that collaboration, in part, would include our having duplicate archive materials of this project, of this research study for one year. So that is a reminder to all of you that if you are interested in giving your notes or copies of your remarks to Sarah, who is the archivist for the Nevada Museum of Art and the Center for Art and Environment, we would be very happy. So any materials, any printed ephemera you have that you can leave behind uh, with Sarah, that would be most welcome. So thank you. Um, and I also uh, and, intend, I have to confirm this with our director, but I'm hoping uh, to name uh, Benoit as a research fellow um, with the Center for Art and Environment for the next two years. So that's uh, going to be a continuation of this, of this collaboration. We'll formalize that. Um, what I'm going to do is show some images that are more about practice than theory. I'm going to try and not speak too quickly, but I urge you to write down, because I will just go right straight through everything, write down questions or notes or, Bill, what was that name? And then we can either do that over lunch or dinner. You can, you can ask me about these things. Um, there is one project at the very end. If we have time, I would like to talk about it. It's Australia. It involves indigenous Aboriginal people. If I'm going to do that, however, Stefan will have to stop filming. You can record the sound, but you cannot record the images. That's, you're nodding OK. So if we have time, I'll, I'll do that too. So, Sarah, will you look at me and give me 10 and 5 minutes? Good. Okay. So what we have been doing uh, while we've been here, uh, the very first thing we did was go to Furka Pass and look at the most extraordinary collection uh, of activity over the time period uh, that Benoit mentioned. Uh, I love the watermarks on this photograph. It's been branded. Thank you. There's some kind of commercial advantage to doing this. So you can't escape it. So I'm not sure what Daniel Buren would think about this, but here it is. And uh, yesterday in Zurich, I found this wonderful painting by Johann Heinrich Wust uh, uh, of the, the, uh, the Ruhr Glacier, 1775. So this is already a site uh, of the archetypal images for the Alps uh, and the, the purity of nature, the grandeur of nature. This is a, an image that is obviously right as the sublime is being talked about and being formed. Um, and as so often happens, it's not just, and can you see behind me the figures? Can you see the little figures? In there? Yeah, if I go this way, dodge. Um, always you have this picture, not just of figures in the landscape, but of an artist actually doing something with the landscape, of actually beginning to image the landscape. Uh, and that's an important kind of activity that I'll talk about in my scheme, my overall framework for this morning, which is the art of the Anthropocene, which I will explain. Uh, we've also been looking at this project that Benoit talked about uh, in the R and Art. Uh, program that is going on. So we look at circles here and we look at circles here, you know, so it's <laughs> nice to have, nice to have the, the various kinds of, and these circles only pop into alignment, obviously it's anamorphic, so if you're out of, you're not on this vantage point, everything falls apart beautifully into these arcs on different buildings, uh, and to some degree the hyzer does too. If you're not standing in the right place, you don't perceive this entire form. We have been looking at objects in the landscape. We approached this one with some trepidation. Julian, in particular, had to sort of shield his eyes very carefully. Uh, but you can see a progression in the kinds of, 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 of things that have been plopped down in the landscape. Uh, this is the bearing baby sculpture, which is a very strange biological notion. Um, and then there's this, this, this sort of critique of the site uh, and, and its own process. And I'll come back to things that have been done in these two programs these are early, well, this is an early example. This is 2011. This is 2012. Uh, is it 2012? 14. 2014. 14. This, is, this is brand new. And I'll come back to other projects uh, at the very end in these two programs. This is the Nevada Museum of Art. It is 82 years old. This building is 12 years old. It is about a little less than 20,000 square meters. 
Um, it was founded by two friends, one of whom was a climate, early climate scientist, and the other person was a collector. And those two people, when they got together, said, let us have a place where scientists and artists and humanists can talk. Um, that was in the 1930s. And this idea of art and environment is actually embedded in the DNA of the museum, of the organization. So it's not a new idea that we are doing this. We do study things like this. This is not in our, in our collections, obviously. This is Albert Bierstadt's painting uh, of the Rocky Mountains, Lander Peak. There is no such thing as Lander Peak. He made it up. And it's this kind of encyclopedic image um, that is not just, not just cultural in intent, but also scientific. It is a catalog of the geology and, and botany and biology that you see, as well as the, the relationship of the, of the Indian tribes, the so-called pure Arcadian impulse in the American West. So when we understand this sort of idea of national identity being formed around these kinds of images. We do, we do think about these things at the museum, but more often than not, we think about things such as this. As this. This is a, a photographic work by James Sanborn, who is a sculptor and photographer from Washington, DC. He did the public art project for the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. Every public building in America, every federal building has to have a public art project. He, he did a crypto analysis project that's very wonderful. It's never been cracked all the way, the code. Um, but when he was there, he found that there's these projectors exist that you can use to make very, very big, light up very, very big forms. And so here's Shiprock in New Mexico. It's a volcanic plug, 1,500 feet high, and he's lighting it at night with this projector. Uh, it's a long exposure, as you can see by the little arcs that the stars make. He is dealing with a sacred site that you are not allowed to climb, that you should not even really touch. You should leave it alone. And so he imposes the Western cartographic grid. He imposes the cartographic imperative on a natural landform that is sacred to the local people. and but doesn't actually touch it. So he gets the best of both worlds, and we're very interested in that kind of discussion. We also look at things like this. This is the Trans-Alaska Pipeline that Matt Coolidge from Cluey and I drove all 800 miles of it a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Uh, well, we're very interested in this as a built environment. We're interested in how it orders the landscape around it. We're interested in how it attracts the military and then why that would attract artists to come deal with that. We also collect archives from um, Brenda Schneebern's daughter and Mark Wilson. This is the Nanook project about the polar bears in the UK, where they gather together all of the taxidermied, you probably know this project, they gather together all of the taxidermied, or images of all the taxidermied polar bears uh, in Great Britain, and then they, they uh, made a project of this. So we have this archive from this project. We also collect Burning Man. Um, and we won't talk much about that today, but it's fascinating. This is Baker Beach in 1986. This is the first man being raised. That's what it looks like today. Sarah and I go every year to work with the archives, work with artists on the playa. This is about 70,000 people, not quite, 68,000 people, camped on a 400 square mile uh, playa, a dry lake bed. So um, I want to talk about the art of the Anthropocene and how all of this sort of fits into that. And this is the only slide I will show you with text on it, I promise. Um, the Anthropocene was defined by Paul Kreutzen, uh, a stratospheric chemist who won the Nobel Prize uh, in the mid-1990s along with two other people for discovering the mechanism for the depletion of ozone in the atmosphere. In 2000, he is in Mexico at a conference of geomorphologists and they are talking about the Holocene, the recent era of the last 10,000 years that followed the Pleistocene, the Ice Age. And Kreitzen says, we're no longer in the Holocene. We're no longer in what we think of as being the stable period of climate uh, through which uh, human beings propagate around the planet. We're now in the Anthropocene. And everyone stops and says, what are you talking about? And he says, well, since 1790s, we have been laying down a carbon of strata around the world, a strata, sorry, a strata of carbon around the world because we've been burning fossil fuels. And he said, I've been to the Antarctic, and I've been to Greenland, and I've taken cores on the ice, and I've pulled out the same soot, and you look at the isotopes, and it comes from whales. That is how you define a geological epoch, a worldwide stratigraphic change, whole Anthropocene. There is, of course, a commission that will decide whether or not this will be officially adopted as nomenclature, and they will make a decision in 2016. But in the meantime, many people, uh, first scientists and now more, more broadly cultural theorists, are adopting this term as a lens through which to look at 
uh, certain activities, human activities, since the 1790s. 1790s, James Watt's steam engine becomes commercially viable, and so it starts to burn coal around the world, and that is a process that goes very slowly and accumulates with chemicals in the atmosphere, and more importantly, the ocean, um, until the 1950s, until World War II. After World War II, there is a tremendous acceleration, a great acceleration in the consumption uh, of chemicals and in the production of commodities. And what we have is a chemical signature that changes radically and very quickly. So I don't know if you had seen the, the movie An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore, um, but that's an example where you see he gets on a lift, he's charting, he shows the chart of the rise of chemicals in the, in the Earth's systems, uh, going like this until the 1950s, and then he has to get on a lift and go upwards, the curve is so steep on the screen and he can't even with the lift get to the top of the image to show you where that curve has now gone. So it's a great acceleration of change around the planet. In the 1990s there is a third stage of the Anthropocene that has been defined by Kreutzen and others. So first stage industrialization, second stage great acceleration, third stage is a self-awareness of what this is doing on Earth systems and the fact that not only are human beings changing the systems of the Earth globally, but we have a choice to make about how we participate in that change. And I'm going to propose that you can, if you wish, parse artworks made in those three periods into these three different ideas, and I'll show you how. And again, just one lens, many different lenses through which to look at all of these objects, all of these images, but here's one lens. Alexander von Humboldt, he goes to South America in 1799 with his friend, the botanical illustrator, Amy Bonpoin, uh, and they make the first credible map of the interior of South America. They show how the basins of the Orinoco and the Amazon rivers connect. They collect thousands of specimens that they send back to Europe. And along the way, as a lark, they climb what was then thought to be the tallest mountain in the world, Chimborazo in Ecuador. And that's what you see up here is the steaming summit of a live volcano. They made it to 19,000 feet. They did not quite make it all the way because um, they were tired and it was smelly and it was cold. But they were also dressed in waistcoats, silk waistcoats and top hats and street shoes. You know, it's amazing what they did. So what you can see on the left-hand side of the screen is you see a, a picture of the physical geography a discipline, by the way, that Alexander von Humboldt invents, um, a picture of the physical geography of the mountain. And on the, on the other side, you see a list of all the plants encountered along the way as they gain in elevation up this mountain. And he realizes something very important. He says, oh, these plants cluster together. There's tropical, there's semi-tropical, there's temperate, there's subalpine, there's alpine, and then there's just the top where there's just eternal snow and nothing else. And he realizes the same thing was true when he was in the Alps hiking. Oh. The plants cluster together. And he realized, oh, going up in altitude is like going up in latitude away from the equator. Aha. Uh -huh. So I wonder if there are equal lines of temperature around the planet, isotherms, that govern the clumping of these plants. This is the beginning of Earth system science, and he's going to be his disciple and his follower, Ernst Haeckel, who's going to rescue the Greek word ecology and bring it forward at the end of the 19th century into our vocabulary. It's based on this painting based on this drawing, this illustration. These are the kinds of things that come out of Alexander von Humboldt's journey. He goes home, he publishes multiple volumes. In fact, he publishes basically an encyclopedia of his trip. It is, takes all of his family fortune to do this and it is so expensive he never owned a complete set himself. These kinds of visual manifestations, artists in various parts of the world, particularly in America, took to heart. They love these kinds of these kinds of displays. And one very nice thing that's interesting, sorry, Stefan. You can't see it here, but way up here, there is a farm. And that farm indicates the highest place in this scheme of the world, of the world's highest mountains and latitude and altitude and elevation and temperature. It represents a place where you can have a sustainable presence in the landscape. You can actually make your living off the land. Frederick Church loved all of this stuff. He read Alexander von Humboldt's books. He loved the illustrations. He goes to South America. He goes to Ecuador. He follows, he follows Alexander von Humboldt's and Amy Bonplan's exact steps. He stays in the same inns. He looks at the same things. And he makes a series of paintings about this over the years. Um, he was a Hudson River painter, landscape painter, so very important already in New York City as a well-known <coughs> purveyor of these <coughs> images of America. 
But he goes back and he creates this. This is the heart of the Andes. It is hanging in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's, it's a painting you can look at. You can parse this in terms of colonial terms. You can certainly talk about it in terms of the history of landscape art. But you can also talk about this as a scientific encyclopedia of a mountain that is the eternal snows and the entire hydrological regime that comes downstream from that all the way to that tropical waterfall. The trees he is depicting are actual species found there. And when he showed this in New York, he set it up on a stage and he put palm, he put some of those trees, real trees imported from South America on either side. <laughs> he made you sit about the distance from that door to here. He made you stand behind a velvet rope to look at this painting and he rented you binoculars, opera glasses, to see the painting for 25 cents a piece. He made a fortune. He made $10,000 doing that. And what he did, of course, was he created an experience where you had to project yourself into the landscape. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Then he sold the painting for $10,000, another $10,000, the most expensive painting sold in America to that time. Um, he wanted to ship it to Germany for Alexander von Humboldt to see it, actually to Paris, for him to see it. Uh, but Alexander von Humboldt died just months before the painting reached him. So this is, a, this is a level one Anthropocene piece of art. It is a catalog of the world. It is an attempt to understand Earth systems. <clears throat> this is Timothy O'Sullivan in the 1870s. He's in the American West. This is not too far from our museum. It's called Karnak Ridge. It's named after an Egyptian antiquity because in America, geology was considered to be the antiquity because we didn't have old buildings, monuments. Um, and this is uh, Timothy O'Sullivan working at the behest of, uh, working for Clarence King, a scientist, a geologist, who is making a traverse across Western America to try and understand the difference between the catastrophic formation of geomorphology of the Earth and uniform processes. Clarence King is basically saying it's not the great flood, a biblical flood, that carves up the planet. It's erosion. It's erosion. And so the problem was he kept coming across evidences of violent processes, and so this artist is documenting this for him. Uh, and eventually Clarence King, right before he dies, he goes back to Yale, where he got his degree in science, and he says, in fact, it's both uniform and cat catastrophe that make the planet. Uh, we would today call that punctuated equilibrium. That's a, that's a theory that we basically accept now. Timothy O'Sullivan was also asked by Clarence King to begin to photograph human interventions in the landscape. So this is a uh, silver stamping mill that was, again, not too far from Reno. Um, this site today, if you go to the site, there is not a single brick on the site. It's just, in the, and the sagebrush has all grown back. It's just desert again. But Clarence King knew that the land was changing, <coughs> and he knew the human beings were changing the land. It wasn't just geology that was a force. And in fact, since the early 1900s, human beings have been a more powerful geomorphological force on the planet than rain. We move more dirt around than rain. So anyway, Clarence King saw this beginning to happen. Um, Bill, what year are we in for the, those photographs? These are 1870s. I want to say 1876. Yeah. So I'm going to skip a huge chunk of art history and take you straight to Ansel Adams, who is the end, in a way, an end of the first stage of the Anthropocene. This is an image made in the Owens Valley, which is the eastern central eastern part of California. You are looking at Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the United States. It's not, it's, a, it's a, almost a 4,000 meter peak, not quite, it's 14,000 feet. So, um, and it's a very famous landscape photograph. Many of you have seen this, I know. Um, it's very picturesque in the foreground and very sublime in the background. Uh, these beautiful bands of light and shadow and light and then dark sky, which Ansel Adams has made artificially dark in the, when he makes the photograph. So there's this beautiful alternating currency for you as you gaze into this, into this landscape. And he is proposing this as a pure Edenic experience. And he is proposing this, this is a, an image that becomes foundational for the, for the beginning of the Sierra Club and the beginning of the environmental movement. He is proposing this as what we should preserve. There are two things he has done to this photograph that are very interesting. One of which is on the left-hand side, right over here, there's actually, there are actually two letters in white stones that are stones that have been whitewashed, painted white, that spell out LP for Lone Pine, which is the town that's just over here. So this is, and, that's, and schools, school children in America, in the American West, do this. They put the initials of their town up 
on a hillside so you can see it as a kind of way of signing the landscape, saying we live here. He erases that in the darkroom. And in fact, he dislikes it so much that he eventually has his assistant scrape it off the negative so you can't see any trace of that human being, that human intervention wants it. He does not want you to know that's there. Behind these trees is the Los Angeles aqueduct that takes the water from this valley that made San Fernando possible. If you ever saw the movie Chinatown, this is the aqueduct that William Mulholland was building to make Los Angeles possible, or its growth possible. So here, this is the last kind of photographic evidence that you can make in a photograph like this and you can, you can erase human presence. You can kind of get away from, I mean, you, more of that has been done. People are still trying to do that. But this is very hard now already when he's making this image in the 1940s. This is 1944, I think, when he's doing this. He was actually commissioned to go document Manzanar, the concentration camp where he put Japanese Americans. Um, <coughs> and he didn't, he was uncomfortable doing that. He couldn't handle that. So he went off and was photographing the landscape. He was with Dorothea Lang, who actually did, did a marvelous body of work at Manzanar at the same time. 1950, William Garnett. He has uh, gotten out of the army. He has flown home uh, across the United States in a cockpit of a military transport plane. And he decides he wants to become a pilot himself and begin to take aerial photographs of the changes in America and the American landscape. A few years later, 1950, he is hired by the man who is building this housing development. Um, this is called Lakewood. It's right outside. It's on the border of Los Angeles. It's one of these cities that's been incorporated into Los Angeles. And you're looking at land that used to be orange groves that has been stri scraped clean and then basically had this subdivision of rep re repetition uh, that has metastasized across the, across the surface of the earth. <clears throat> I flew over this landscape with Dennis Cosgrove a few years ago, the great British geographer who was no longer with us. Uh, and it was a beautiful neighborhood. Every house had been modified. There were trees everywhere. It's a walkable neighborhood. You can go shopping, go to a movie theater, do whatever you need to do, go to school, all within this neighborhood on foot. You don't have to drive anywhere. It's a very desirable place to live. But this was used as evidence in opposition to this photograph in the same book called This is the American Earth. So Ansel Adams put this picture at the beginning, and he put this picture and some others by William Garnett about Los Angeles in the middle, and he made this dialect. He made this proposition that good, bad, we want, we want the good. And then he pops out at the end of the book with more pictures of nature. William Garnett himself was so disturbed by this photograph, he moved from Los Angeles and moved to San Francisco. You will recognize this, the Beshers documenting blast furnaces, um, assembling a typology of blast furnaces and other industrial structures throughout their career. The reason the light, there are two reasons, or several reasons, why the light in these photographs, their work is so flat, one of which is um, they admired the work of Timothy O'Sullivan. Timothy O'Sullivan could only photograph at very, like from 10 until 2 during the day, because the emulsions in his film were not sensitive enough to capture light at any other time of the day. They admired O'Sullivan and other photographers capturing these typologies, and so they become part of this group, the new topographers, described by William Jenkins when he curates that exhibition. So this is now the beginning of the documentation, that image by William Garnett, this image by the Beshers. This is part of a movement to document the Great Acceleration. So we are documenting the spread, spread of the human footprint around the planet, right? So it's a big change. As this footprint is spread and it's inescapable and you can't get away from it, Artists begin to then make their own footprint directly in the land, and this is now fully second stage art of the Anthropocene. We're not just going to make a picture of the landscape, we're going to do something with the landscape, physically. We're going to do something in it. We're going to insert something. I would not, I'd like to make a distinction between insertion and intervention. Intervention is when you actually change how a place functions, but this is an insertion. This is Richard Long in Peru in 1972. He is constructing just a circle of stones not so far away from where Alexander von Humboldt was in the Andes. This circle of stones, um, I will contrast with Michael Heiser's big piece, uh, City, in just a minute. This circle of stones, because so little rain falls here, um, the rain events there are fairly mild, at least they have been, unless climate change alters this. Uh, this circle of stones could last for 10,000 years. It could be like the Nazca stones, which are not that old, they're much, less, they're much younger. But this circle could last for a very long time. 
1970, here's Michael Heiser moving a rock. This is displace, replaced mass. It is right outside of, of Reno at Spooner Summit, going into the Lake Tahoe region. I will drive you to the site so you can see where this happened. Um, you know, he is still doing this. So he makes this move in 1970, and he just did levitate a mass at the LA County Museum of Art. Heiser, everything Heiser is going to do in his career, practically, he does between 1967 and 1972. I think Julian is where you and I think that, yeah, he's done with that. So here's the, the, the motorcycle drawing that he made in the Mojave Desert. Actually, it's on Gene Dry Lake, just outside of Las Vegas. This is 1970. Michael Heiser uh, and friends drawing with these motorcycles on the desert, these circles. You will note, by the way, that this piece is not the same in its form, exact form, as the one here. It's a related piece, but it's not exactly the same. And of course, here he is here. He's repeating a gesture. He's made, make, he does this in his entire career. He repeats, repeats these gestures. This is City. So this is what Michael Heiser starts in 1971 with Complex One, with that bunker shape you kind of all know with the steel beams that come out of it. This is more than a mile long. It's about, it's about two kilometers long. It is um, a quarter of a mile wide. It is 20 feet down on the ground and 20 feet above the ground. That's his, uh, off to the left-hand side is his ranch. This is an image taken from a commercial airplane flying from Las Vegas to Reno. Someone simply looked out the window and said, I know what that is. This is so big, at 35,000 feet, he could take a picture of it like this, right? That's a famous photograph from the New York Times. Michael Heiser does not allow people to photograph his work because he wants you to come there and experience it directly. The same philosophy, I think, with Furka. You know, it's a very much about the isolation. The point of the isolation is that you have to make an effort to get there and see it. You will create an experience for yourself to make the artwork in your mind. You can see how large this is. This is a dialogue. The point of city is a dialogue between, between Western geometrical forms and Mesoamerican geometry. And he wants a dialogue between forms of sort of, a, for him, uh, two very old traditions in the world. His point about this, this, this site is also that he does not really want you to look at the mountains. He does not want you to know where you are. He wants you to be embedded down in it. So you're just looking at this dialogue among these geometries. So that's why it's 20 feet below grade and why uh, it makes this encircling walls around you. But in the landscape itself, this is on the edge of Mike's property. In the landscape itself, you see the cottonwood trees, but you hardly see the work at all. You can see in this photograph the trucks in the distance. When they are gone and the sides of the outside of city are planted with native grasses, you won't see it. The desert's a very big place. If you have been to see Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson and you see how small it is, it's monumental in photographs. But actually, when you're there, it's pretty small. This is still second stage of the Anthropocene. This is still just doing something with the land. <coughs> you all know this, Walter de Maria, the lightning field. Um, and it's a very interesting site. You know, it is one mile wide and one kilometer deep. Sarah says, I have 10 minutes and I really have to go fast. And so it's bounded by a fence. Very controlled experience. This is um, Richard Box. This is called a lighting field. So Walter de Maria is about heaven and earth. This is about sky and ground. This is uh, someone who's taking fluorescent tubes outside, which there's so much power leaking out of these 400,000 volt lines that you can hold a fluorescent tube up and it will light up. So what he does is he pulls off a freeway, he puts out 1,900 fluorescent tubes in a field, they light up, and he invites people to have a picnic. So he's making a gesture in opposition to, so he's making visible a system of the world, in this case he is making visible the system of our power grid around the planet, and this is beginning to get towards the third stage of the Anthropocene project. When Michael Heiser and Robert Smithson are sitting in bars in New York talking about making art, there is a young woman with them. Her name is Patricia Johansson. Patricia um, eventually goes to ups and she's hardly allowed to talk. She doesn't drive a bulldozer, so she's like, you know, not qualified to be in the conversation. But she's listening. She goes to upstate New York. She makes these beautiful garden drawings. Um, this is one that proposes two water courses in the, in the form of snakes uh, that will purify water in her garden. She now moves more dirt than Michael Heiser. This is a tertiary level wastewater treatment plant, a sewage plant. You can drink the water from this plant. She has made the form of this land to look like the head of a mouse. 
that is indigenous to that site that was endangered. She was brought in to change the nature of the site so it became a park. As a result, the biodiversity went up tremendously and it's used by everyone from people walking their dogs to classes from the schools to look at the biology of the, of the site. That's a third stage of the Anthropocene artwork because what she is doing is addressing an environmental issue, a problem, an earth systems science issue, and she is doing something to change how it functions. So it's not just looking at the landscape and representing it, it's not just putting something in it, it's like doing something. This is art that we, at the museum we, we call art that walks in the world. Yeah? Proposal by the Harrisons who invented eco-art, they are doing something in the Sierra Nevada to deal with the rising of the temperature and the plants going away. That green strip represents a, a place where they are making plant ensembles at different elevations to test how plants that can be brought in will be resilient to the, the rise in temperature, therefore control erosion. Alexander von Humboldt would have understood this property, this project exactly. Atacama Desert, northern Chile, driest place on the planet outside of the Antarctic. Not a single blade of grass in this photograph. Only one of two I've ever taken like that. The other was in the Antarctic. You can, you can, the only fresh water, source of fresh water that comes in over the coast of northern Chile comes in fog. And you can drink the clouds. If you put up little screens like this, the fog hits the screens, it condenses, it falls down. The green things you see growing there are not seeds that were brought in from the outside. They are seeds that are in the desert, that are still viable, that will bloom if you give them water. I won't get into the archaeology of the site, but the people have been doing this on this exact site for thousands of years, but not with screens, just by using a cliff face. I went with some students um, to look at, to see how we could also make fog screens, among other things fog catchers. This is a result. Now, something like this was done about 12 years ago above a village and it produced enough fresh water that they could stop paying a lot of money to have water trucked in. They could just make water. They made so much water from a fog catcher like this every day that then not only did the village of several hundred people have enough water to drink, they could also raise food and they could export the food to other villages up and down the coast. But after 10 years, that project was gone. They let it go because it was ugly and they thought it was stupid. So the idea was to then come back with architects who would try and design different kinds of fog catchers that would look amazing and that would be attractive, but would have an aesthetic component so people would care for the site and care for the project. This is just one test made by one group coming there. It looks like a starship has crashed. This is eventually what they came up with. It is called the Fog Garden. It is a project that catches fog and that grows things both on site and sends water down to the village. This was supposed to be built until Chile had a major earthquake several years ago that took out part of Santiago, so the budget now is gone. They're waiting for the budget to come to do this. The local people who saw this in those villages down below said, this is beautiful, we will take care of it. And we want people to come from around the world to see it. So there's this mix of tourism. There's always this economic advantage that people, there's a motive somewhere that's not always just aesthetic. Yeah? John Reed, Australia, the Fishman Project. There is a forest, five minutes, Sarah says, there is a forest in Australia that is very old. It's a 200 million year old ensemble of plants from when Australia and the Antarctic were still joined. John Reed um, makes an artistic discovery in this forest. He discovers the last known hominid on the, unknown hominid on the planet. It's called the Fishman, it lives in the water. There's only one apparently. He never saw it in person. He can only photograph it if he set up his camera and it was tripped remotely by this creature going by. He calls a press conference. Now this forest is being threatened by a logging company. Someone's going to come in and take out the timber. So he calls a press conference and he says, but wait, you can't log this property because the, the only last discovered species of a hominid is here. This is incredibly rare and valuable. In the press conference, which is attended by every television station in Australia, this is in New South Wales, in, uh, every newspaper, they go, right, okay, but they publish it. And he starts getting phone calls from around the country, people saying, I have seen the fish man. This of course is John Reed swimming naked in the water. Our archive has the 50 foot long cable release he used to trip the shutter. Yeah? They made the forest into a national park. That's art that walks in the world. It changes the way the world functions. It's a performance piece. Mm -hmm. Outside of Reno, a river is, uh, was straightened by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It almost died. Now it's being re-meandered, so it's alive. This creates some erosion issues. 
The artist Daniel McCormick and Mary O'Brien measure that stream bank at the top. They weave together a structure out of native willows and they stake it into the ground with live willow pieces. After two years, the hand of the artist is gone and you have this structure that provides habitat and controls erosion and just becomes part of the stream bank. So from sculpture to stream bank. Third stage of the Anthropocene artwork. Here's one they just did, uh, again, about 30 miles south of Reno. And my last project that I'll show you. Lauren Bond is an artist in Los Angeles who has a, a place called the Metabolic Studio. That's a very important name, Metabolic, because he's really being ecological about it. Lauren Bond, B-O-N. This is Owens Dry Lake. This is very close to where Ansel Adams took that picture of the winter sunrise in the Sierra Nevada and Mount Whitney. This is an abandoned plate glass factory. Lauren Bond buys the factory, or rents the factory. And she has a truck that's a camera obscura. It's a truck the size of this building almost. And she drives it around, a little pinhole camera, and makes pictures. And this is a picture of that facility used by her camera obscura. But then she takes that silo on the end, on the left-hand side. She turns it into a camera obscura. And it takes, starts taking pictures of the dry lake bed, which has some water on it for dust control. So she realizes that Hollywood not just took the water from the Owens Valley, they took the chemicals from this lake to process to coat the film that was used as film stock for the movies being made nearby. The cowboy movies were being made right where Ansel Adams shot that photograph. So the silver up in the mountains on the other side of this, of this dry lake and the chemicals from this lake were sent to Rochester, New York for, to Kodak and put on the film which was then shipped back to Los Angeles, which was then used to make cowboy movies about the national identity of America. And she says, what if we learn to do that ourselves here? What if we learn to harvest these chemicals here and these minerals here? What if we oh, reopen the silver mine and just employ a few people, it's like a boutique silver mine, and we give that business to the people who live in Lone Pine? What if we learn how to get the chemicals from the lake to make a chemical process and we give that as a business to the people in Lone Pine? People in Lone Pine have had all their water sucked out by Los Angeles, so all of the orchards are gone and the agriculture's gone. What if we replace the agriculture with this kind of dark ecology art projects? There's the camera obscura on the truck. <coughs> so what they're doing, bless you, is they have big <coughs> photographic paper, developing paper. They have put the chemicals on, they have harvested out of the lake, they've coated the paper with that, they put it in the truck, they go out, and during the day, they take the lens cap off the holes in the truck. They make a picture. They expose the paper. They wait until it's dark. Then they go out and they dig a trench in the desert, in the dry lake bed itself. They put the paper in the dry lake bed. They cover it up. They walk away from it for three days. They come back, and you have finished photographs. The land is taking a picture of itself. And she's creating a social practice around this process to give business to the Owens Valley. That is a very, very complete third stage of the Anthropocene project. This is our gallery at the museum where we put archive shows. And what we did was we recreated a pond of the actual material to show how the actual uh, salt water evaporates and the forms, the patterns that it forms in the land. So I think, I think based on two things I saw here this week, I think the third stage of the Anthropocene is coming in the art world to the valet. This is one project, why I think this is so, and, the, and I, the video project even more so. But this is a construct that's made on a house that was condemned to make a resort. And so what has happened is the artists have been given this house, the team of the brothers have been given this house to make this sort of chaotic structure. Not totally chaotic, because it holds together and they have social events inside the structure. They live in this while they're building it, and they bring the community in physically to have tea, to have coffee, to have conversation. That's beginning to be pretty interesting. So it's not just putting the circles on the houses. It's actually doing something to one of the houses and bringing the community into it. <coughs> and then here's that project, um, you know, um, by, by, I'm sorry, his name again is Tateyek or whatever it is, yeah. Uh, so this is a, that, that uh, uh, 3D foundation project up above, above Verbier, the stacks of the bags of concrete. I do not think physically this piece will work. The intent is that the rain will interact with it and snow and so forth, and it will actually set the concrete inside the bags, and then the paper will erode away in the wind, and you'll be left with a wall of concrete. I think physically it's not likely to work, but it's a very interesting idea to collaborate with nature itself and to make a comment on the place. 
It is not changing the function. Now, if this project also controlled erosion, it would be a third stage of the Anthropocene project because it would be changing the function of the place. So that is a, that's the framework through which I've been looking at many of these projects here. I've been thinking about the change of representation in that 1775 painting and the beautiful photographic history of the Alps. And then I've been thinking about objects placed in it that speak to the place that are site specific. And then I've been thinking about when will the artists who will actually help the environment of the Alps show up and make projects. I suspect those things are already going on here. We just haven't, I haven't seen them yet, but they're probably here happening. So thank you very much. Thank you.